All right, so up next, we have our first Q&A session, FinHub and Digital Assets Developments at the SEC. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome up the moderator, Ruben Younglum. Uh, Ruben is the managing editor of the C Crypto Economic Systems Journal and Conference Series, an interdisciplinary effort between the DCI and MIT Press. He is a fellow at Stanford Law School's Codex Center for Legal Informatics, where he runs the Blockchain Education Initi Initiative serves as a coordinator for the RegTrax Blockchain Regulatory Tracking Initiative and co-hosts the Our Data podcast. Uh, second, I'd like to welcome our guest, Valerie Stepanek. Valerie is the director of the Strategic Hub for Innovation and Financial Technology, also known as FinHub, um, an office at the, University, uh, the US Securities and Exchange Commission, SEC. Before that, she was the senior advisor for digital assets and innovation, and an associate director in the SEC's Division of Corporation Finance. She also served as assistant director in the SEC Division of Enforcement's uh, Cyber Unit. Please join me in welcoming Ruben and Valerie to the stage. All right, hi everybody. Um, I hope that uh, that you can hear me. I think um, I think Valerie is coming just a second here. Oh, yep. Valerie, I think you're. I think can you're hear you, Ruben. There we go. Hi there. I think oh. you can probably hear me and see me now. Everything yes, good? Can. Thank you. Perfect. Worked out all the technical snafus. <laughs> um, <laughs> get that get that out of the way early. Exactly. Um, so uh, yeah, as as uh, as was already stated, we have uh, Valerie Stepanek here. Um, she is uh, affectionately known as the, the crypto czar by the the crypto community, and that's that's I'm very very excited to uh, to be speaking with her today. So let's just start out and. Uh, Say Cryptozar, how do you feel about about that nickname? Um, I imagine that uh, you don't seem you don't seem sad when people refer to you as a Cryptozar, but I imagine it also comes with some some pressure. A little bit of pressure, um, uh, you know. It's probably easier to remember and say than my real last name. Um, it does have a Z in it, but um, the fact that you know the the community itself dubbed me the Cryptozar is. Just, I guess flattering, and I hope I uh, live up to the name and and hopefully be a benevolent czar. <laughs> <laughs> well, so far, so good. Um, so, what would you say is uh, one of the biggest mis misconceptions about what you do or what the SEC does? Um, I think that that it would be easy for there to be some tensions between the the crypto community and the SEC. Luckily, we're not seeing a lot of that. Um, but I do think there are still some misconceptions about the goals of the SEC and kind of how they approach, approach regulation. It's a great question. I think a lot of people um, may see us as a roadblock. And unfortunately, um, you know, I think in the, in the industry of the financial world, um, it's just very heavy, heavily regulated industry when you're managing people's money or people's assets. Um, oftentimes it's their retirement, you know, nest egg. Um, there are a lot of rules and regulations to follow. And in the United States, there's a lot of overlapping and concurrent jurisdictions um, between regulatory agencies on the federal side and on the state side. So I think people see us as a roadblock sometimes. Um, and on the other hand, I think a lot of people want us to tell them, you know, what to do. So when, when projects come in, they often say, just tell us what to do. But oftentimes, you know, we're, we're the regulator. We're here to tell you um, you're a little too close to the, you know, to the guardrail there or there. We're not there to tell you how to set up your system, how to operationalize around the rules and regulations. But we are there to help you through those rules and regulations. So that's part of what the FinHub does and what it's meant to do is to provide a place for people to come um, and get a very um, informal meeting with the staff of the FinHub. We, um, we, we have built expertise in various technologies um, and we have expertise, of course, in, in interpreting our rules and regulations. Um, and so when people come in, they can have a good conversation with us about their project, about what they wanna do and how they can avoid regulatory pitfalls or if they have to consider, you know, perhaps a fellow regulator across the, you know, across the uh, corridor, we can point them to the CFTC or FinCEN or, or perhaps even, you know, the OCC or FDIC. Um, there are a number of regulators that have various, as I mentioned, jurisdictions in this area. So we are there to help you through that um, process. 
Yeah, um, and I, I think the SEC has done a, a really good job, um, even I would I would say going above and beyond as far as uh, reaching out to the community and making themselves very, very available. Uh, one of the ways they've done that is through uh, FinHub, which you mentioned and, and which you are you are currently running. Can you talk a little bit more about that, maybe backing up a bit for people who don't know what it is? I mean, I think it's such a, such a, a fantastic resource that uh, maybe isn't on the radar uh, of enough people right now. Yeah, no, thank you um, for that for the opportunity to really introduce the group. Um, we were set up formally in 2018 to really consolidate the work that was going across the commission in various tech technology areas. So our main areas that we cover are distributed ledger technology and digital assets, artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, robo advising or automated investment advice, digital online marketplace lending, um, and then kind of the ancillary technologies that are that are being developed around it. So keeping our eye, of course, on, on quantum computing and privacy enhancing technologies. Um, but all that work was kind of going on in, in a disparate way across the commission. And this, this was an effort to consolidate, to not only form a hub within the commission uh, to be inward facing, to help us identify what tools and skills we need to develop and onboard and, and work across the commission to help prepare us as new technologies hit so that we can do our jobs better and more efficiently, but also to provide um, a hub to the outside world. So it's really a place where people can come um, and get their first landing spot with the SEC and we can help them navigate through the process. But we wanna encourage beneficial um, innovation and responsible innovation. Um, and so, you know, that really is our format. Um, and although we're a portfolio, you know, I just mentioned what our portfolio is, we, we tend to try to develop with how the financial industry is develop, developing. Um, we were very busy over the past year. Um, and, and I think in response to that, our, our office was elevated to be its own office. We report directly to the chairman now. And I think that gives, I think it signifies um, a couple things. First, that innovation is really important to the commission. Um, and second, we wanna solidify our place, make it permanent within the agency and make ourselves um, even more efficient having that direct line of reporting to the, to the chairman. Yeah, um, so I think uh, just in case that it wasn't clear, FinHub is a, is a standalone office now as of relatively, re relatively recently within the SEC. Um, and they're very, I would say public facing. Um, so anybody who's an entrepreneur uh, there are a lot of people listening to this uh, that probably run token projects. It's a really, really good resource uh, to, to connect with the SEC and just uh, just get some information about how to do things, how to do things well. Um, so has anything really, really changed in a concrete sense now that you've become a standalone office? Has that changed either your approach to regulation now that you have a, a little bit of a different platform or has it changed anything internally about how you are, are dealing with the SEC or approaching the space? Yeah, I mean, I think it really, it's an organizational evolution and it helps formalize us within the agency. So it puts us, it better situates us to be this kind of umbrella over all the activities happening across the divisions and offices so we can facilitate um, new innovations as they're coming into our, into our realm. Um, I think externally, the user experience is gonna remain pretty much the same. You're gonna still come to the web portal um, we still try to get people in to talk to us within a week or two of um, coming to us. Um, and you're still gonna deal not only with the FinHub itself, but the spokes that come off the hub are really the delegates to all our divisions and offices. So when you have a meeting with us, we're gonna bring in expertise. If you're, if you're meeting with us about a new trading platform, we may be bringing people in from trading and markets who have the expertise in trading platforms. We're also going to have people from the FinHub who have that expertise in whatever your technology is, whether it be distributed ledger technology or some other technology um, or an AI um, application. You know, we'll have those those experts in the room that not only deal with the with the technology itself, but also with the operationalizing of you know a platform that wants to trade something. So um, market experts as well. Right. So um, as Valerie was saying, the FinHub is, uh, is it goes so much um, further beyond just the crypto space. Um, it, it goes into almost every aspect of, of technology. Um, they do have a lot of crypto specific resources. I think there's a, a framework for um, looking through and analyzing whether a digital asset is security and, and some things that, that I think blockchain folks are should be very excited about. Uh, but it, it really is, is, uh, is a wide scope uh, that they cover. 
Um, so kind of following that thread, what do you think some of the, the big issues either within crypto or, or just in technology generally uh, that the SEC will have to grapple with over, uh, let's say the next year or two, so some of the, the kind of newer, uh, more exciting projects? Yeah, I, I think we're really, we're super excited about the, the coming year. I think, um, you know, 2020 was just such a, a intense and unprecedented time. Um, we had to immediately flip to, you know, distributed workforce. We had to um, really rely on technology. I think if this had happened, you know, 20 years ago, who knows where we would be. I think technology and innovators really rose to the occasion. Um, and took advantage of the huge opportunity here, uh, connecting people and how we do our work. So, you know, the pandemic laid bare a lot of challenges uh, that we have, but it also kind of gave, you know, here's an opportunity where we can do better. And so we've been super busy at the SEC, holding the markets together, of course, and making sure that they're they're running okay and, and that people have relief that they need um, as they face challenges of the pandemic. But the FinHub docket has been super, super busy. Um, we've been dealing with things from, you know, international work around stable coins, for example, um, or international work around the, the FATF standards dealing with virtual asset and virtual asset service providers. Um, IOSCO is doing some work. Uh, we're looking, we're doing a deep dive into DeFi. Um, we have a number of projects coming in uh, on different fronts. We have a number of projects that have gone through, for example, the registration process. So you've, you've seen companies now, um, you know, offering and selling securities pursuant to a registration st statement, some of them pursuant to uh, no action relief or pursuant to some exemption. Um, we've had a couple of companies that are digital asset related um, register under the 1940 Act as investment companies. Um, we've had uh, a statement out by the commission in December about how broker dealers can operationalize and offer broker dealer related services with uh, digital asset securities. And that I think is super exciting because it, it represents, I think, a process of engagement with the, with the, with the um, community. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, broker dealer or, or people who wanted to provide broker dealer services were coming in and talking to us and our staff was identifying things that were challenges like custody. How do you, how do you show custody? How do you, um, you know, comply with the various rules around the safeguarding of customer assets? How do you deal with the fact that um, these types of securities may not be protected under SIPA, which is the um, insurance that usually covers, uh, you know, uh, securities uh, in the event of a broker dealer's liquidation. So all these things um, the staff was raising with folks in the community, they were coming back with having a, a very rich dialogue with, with our staff over um, the course of time. Uh, and then, you know, the, com the commission came out with this uh, broker dealer, special purpose broker dealer custody statement in December. And it did three things. The first thing it did was explain um, the conditions under which a broker dealer can start operationalizing and you know, providing services with respect to digital asset securities to its customers. And then the second part is uh, it's a no action lever letter at the, at the um, level of the commission, which is kind of rare. So the commission has said, if you follow these steps and operate pursuant these conditions, you won't be sued by our division of enforcement for this particular um, provision. And then the third part is it's a request for comment. So it's a request out to the public. Please tell us if we get this wrong, if we could do it better, if we could do it differently. And so we are accepting comments and we're going through a process of, of talking to people who want to talk, talk to us about that uh, statement. And I think that's really exciting. So over the next year, what I see are um, entities coming in who really want to set up a business um, and, and operate pursuant to this custody statement and talking to us about the various challenges, where there's pain points, how they can overcome them, um, and then teaching us really what their practices are. Everybody's business is different. And so, you know, there is no one size fits all when it comes to solutions in this area around, you know, custody, for example, of digital assets. Depends what your business is and who your customers are and how you provide those uh, uh, services to them. Um, and so, as people come in and talk to us through the various business models, I think there's going to be really a lot of kind of breakthroughs in this area. Uh, so I'm excited to, to see that happen. And I also want to um, 
encourage folks who want to comment about that custody statement. There's, if you go to the FinHub website, actually, there's a, a space where all the statements were put out for public comment. Um, so we would welcome anyone to, to send us something in if they want to comment about any of the issues that we've kind of put out there. Oh, what, a, what a great answer. I, I hope uh, any potential broker dealers were taking notes and will now go comment. That would be, that would be ideal. Um, so I, I want to get to uh, uh, DeFi and stablecoins, maybe just in a second, both kind of aspects, aspects that you touched on there. Um, but I, I think you, you painted a, a really accurate picture of 2020 as kind of bizarre for, for a lot of reasons. Yes. Um, how do you think that, that COVID and, and the lockdowns and this whole pandemic has impacted the, the crypto space? Um, you know, I, I sit and I think about it and I go, is it a coincidence that... Uh, you know, everybody's stuck at home, and this is the first year I've kind of heard about meme stocks. And you know, Dogecoin is doing its, do its, do or its Dogecoin is doing its Dogecoin thing. And um, how, how do you think? Uh, how do you think it's it's impacted the the blockchain space or the crypto space? I mean, just from my perspective, it seems like it's really busy. So um, the folks in this area were probably used to distributed workplace. Um, you know, many of them don't have brick and mortar presence. Many many of them are operating. Um, with you know people working from wherever their laptop is, and so I think in that in that sense they probably didn't have a bump in the road. You know, it's just business as usual. Um, I think you know there are efficiencies to be gained, for example, in payment systems and remittance systems, and I think some of the inefficiencies and inadequacies in that in that area were probably. Uh, highlighted during the pandemic when people had to have access to to cash. Um, and so there was a lot of uh, work being done around, you know, stablecoin or so-called global stablecoin. How does it get regulated? How, how do we work in juristic, different jurisdictions when you're putting together an arrangement that's not only multi-jurisdictional, but cross-sectoral? It involves aspects that look like banking, aspects that look like securities, perhaps, aspects that look like just regular payment systems. So how do you kind of regulate that? And I think there's a lot of talk internationally. For example, at the end of last year, the, um, the Financial Stability Board uh, had a group that was looking at the regulation of stable coins, and they put out uh, in October of 2020 a list of 10 high-level high principles that really should apply in this space. Um, and so, you know, there's still work going around in the international regulatory community, looking at how those are implemented and when, where we, um, where we see there may be gaps or need for further, further work. So that's the kind of thing that, that's been really active um, that I've seen. All right. Um, so I think that's the uh, second time that stablecoins have really come up in, in sort of a, a concrete way. So I think that's a sign to ask about your, uh, your view on the role of stablecoins in the digital asset, asset space. How are you thinking about them and, and what they can do and, and potentially any challenges that they might bring? Yeah, um, I always start this conversation, I guess, this type of conversation by saying we don't really ascribe to labels. Um, we always look at behind, you know, what's behind the label. So if something's a so-called stable coin or, you know, some people use the term utility coin, we're really going to say what what it what does that digital asset represent? You know that that public private key pair. What is it conferring upon its holder, a purchaser, or user? Um, you know what are the rights and obligations? What is, what is the economic reality going on before we characterize something? So um, I I will just say at the outset that a stable coin to me is it's a digital asset and it's the same analysis. I'm going to look at what's going on here. Um, it could potentially be a security, it could potentially be a commodity or a derivative on a security or a commodity um, or something else. So I think um, the exciting thing is that, you know, for the first time we've had these, you know, bespoke programmable assets that kind of change with the, inf you know, they change with the information that comes into them and the information that they give off and, and it's a really exciting uh, space. So in stable coins, I guess the idea is that you're trying to create an asset that's not going to be as volatile. It's going to be, it's going to keep its value relative to something else. So there's a few different types. There's the types that tie their value to, you know, a real world asset. There are types that tie their value to another crypto asset. 
Um, and there is some that, that use a stabilization mechanism that may be an algorithm that's going to try to keep the price within a certain band by, um, by modifying the, the, the supply of the tokens in response to demand. So um, there is some way that they're, they're moderating that kind of um, the price level. So you know, I think there's a lot of experimentation going around right now. Um, stable coins, some of them have, have been around for, for, for a little bit, but some of them are still being proposed. Um, and we're definitely keeping our eye on, on them to make sure that they're not creating, you know, consumer or investor protection risks or monetary, you know, policy or stability risks. So that's the kind of work that the, you know, the international groups are doing to make sure that we, that, you know, we can, we can work with people who are innovating to provide all the benefits of a, of a so-called stable coin, which is, you know, efficiencies, speed of remittance, um, accessibility, you know, inclusivity, but avoid the risks uh, if something goes terribly wrong. It, you know, we, we have to recognize that, that people rely on their, I know I, I, I rely on my assets and I rely on um, that they're gonna be there when I, when I need them. And so we wanna make sure that, that they are there, whatever's backing it is actually backing it and that you know, people can, can convert out when they have to, if they have to, and um, that there's recourse if something goes terribly wrong. Uh, so this uh, this idea of uh, the SEC not necessarily putting a lot of weight on on labels for something like a stablecoin and saying, well, whether or not you call it a stablecoin, we want to look at what it does and how it performs in in the world to really make a a good assessment about it. That's really consistent with a lot of things I've heard you say in the past. I think I, I mentioned to you, I, I've seen you speak a couple of times, and you say things like, you know, the SEC regulates the activity, not really the technology, or um, you know, we were talking the other day about how the SEC looks at the activity and not necessarily where the activity takes place. It doesn't matter if it takes place in, in the metaverse or something like that. Um, so uh, can you just explain a little bit about what these philosophies are, are, are getting at when the SEC approaches some piece of regulation? Um, and then as a follow-up there, uh, is that the maybe the key takeaway that you want people to understand about SEC regulation? And if not, what would you say is the key takeaway? Hmm. Um, so the, so maybe I'll start in reverse, like the, 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 the whole purpose of the SEC is really, you know, it's this threefold mission. Um, it's to protect investors, to ensure market integrity, essentially, and, and promote capital formation. Um, and so we are always looking at something through that lens. And when I say that we're technology neutral and, and regulating activity, that it's a pretty consistent approach, I think, taken in across the US and, and probably in many, many countries that if you regulate around technology, there's, there's the fear that you're gonna, first of all, you're gonna steer the technology a certain way. So you may be stifling other innovation that could be happening that might be better or, may, or maybe different um, and provide different, um, you know, you want, you want investors in the markets to have a choice. So you, you don't want as a regulator to be picking the winners and the losers before they're even out of the gate um, so, so it's difficult for us. We don't want to stifle innovation. Um, on the other hand, I understand that you know the call for certainty is um, we we hear and and we can understand that because you know folks are making business decisions. They're going to want to um, make those decisions early, and so they can move forward th with their plans quickly. Um, and that's why one reason I, I would encourage people to come in and talk to FinHub because. And before you start your project <laughs> is ideally the time you want to talk to us or while it's in the planning phases so we can help you issue spot um, and not go down the wrong road. Um, but we're not going to tell you how to design something per se or what technology to use, but we may say, hey, what this is doing, this looks like this type of conduct, which is regulated. Or, you know, over here, you're creating a system where there's money transmission on behalf of customers, you may want to go talk to FinCEN about that because it, it might be something that you need to register with FinCEN about. But I will say, we also count on knowledgeable securities lawyers uh, to provide good counsel to their clients. Um, so we, you know, ideally, we don't want those counsel to, to say, well, this is how you avoid the securities laws, or this is how you avoid getting caught. Like, actually doing an analysis under the securities laws, um, 
you know, because they're the critical gatekeepers, the, the SEC can't, can't see everything. And if the lawyers are doing their jobs, then we can spend more resources, you know, on the positive things and helping people and not, you know, spend, we'll spend less resources in, you know, enforce, in enforcement. And so we don't want people to, obviously, we don't want people to start off violating the law. We want them to start off in a compliant way. Um, and so we do appreciate um, the opportunity to work with people and to, you know, to help out uh, folks who want to come in and just have that conversation with us. Yeah, I, I think that's some really important context to the way that the, the SEC kind of approaches regulation. Right? I mean, that was, a, that was a, I think, a really really clean way to state the mission. You know, one thing I didn't hear in any of the three parts was specifically targeting Bitcoin to shut it down or, or kind of any project like that. It's, uh, it's taking a, a much more macro view of, of some of these, some of these projects. Um, so just in the last couple of minutes, I, I'll turn to some audience questions here. Uh, so the first one, I, I don't know if you'll be able to answer it, um, but um, I'll ask it anyways, because I'm, I'm excited to hear the answer. Um, will we ever have a, a Bitcoin ETF in the US market? And if so, when mm -hmm. that is yeah yeah that is a, a question huh i um you know i can't predict i do i do i will note that so the etf has been or the exchange traded products that have come in on on listing applications have so far been disapproved um and the commission applies this kind of test that it's applied to um commodities based trusts um and and really you know, not to get into the specifics of the test. If you want to read it, there's a long opinion um, in on on the website, the Winklevoss opinion. But it really gets down to how can we trust the pricing? Um, and I think you know the markets are maturing. The markets have matured. Um, I think folks just have to come in and present their application and meet that the standard that's kind of out there. And once they can do that, there's no reason that that one wouldn't go forward. Um, you know, again, I think if you read those decisions, they talk about it's not a question, it's not a merit-based question about the product itself. It's really about, you know, can we trust the underlying market and what's happening and that there's not manipulation and that there's investor protections in place. So it's really about, I, I, I think, you know, and I'm only speaking, I should have mentioned this first, these are only my views and not, as, not the views uh, necessarily of the folks I work with or the commission, but, um, you know, I think as people, as the market changes and as people can meet that standard, you know, there's no reason to think it wouldn't, it wouldn't happen. Okay. Um, so uh, another audience question uh, about the SEC's view regarding the individual custody of Bitcoin, although I think it's, I assume the question is something more like Bitcoin, uh, so digital assets in general, uh, versus ownership of Bitcoin uh, through a bank as a third party, um, and then also versus something like an ETF. Sure. Um, well, first of all, Bitcoin, you know, it's not really within our jurisdiction as Bitcoin. Um, but if you're talking about just digital assets in general or a digital asset that is a security, um, I think a lot of, you know, the, the, the risks around how you hold it are kind of set forth in, that, in the custody statement that I've re referred to. Obviously, um, you know, the private key is really the key. Whoever has it um, has control of that digital asset. And if they lose it or if they share that control, you know, they could lose their asset. So whether someone, you know, is uh, feels comfortable holding it in an unhosted or self-hosted wallet um, or feels more comfortable hosting it somewhere, you know, that's really a choice. Um, I, I know that when, you know, Typically, when you have an intermediary that is acting as a custodian, if it involves securities, then that's where you know the SEC is gonna is really gonna care most about um, how the custodian is is keeping that crypto and making sure it's safe on behalf of their customers. Right. Um, so I think we're running up on on time here, uh, but I do have one more very short and very easy question for mm -hmm. you. Um, what, what's the best way for people to, uh, you know, a lot of people in the audience, I, I think, are, are paying a lot of attention to the SEC and FinHub uh, in particular. What's the best way for people to keep up with what FinHub is doing or maybe even keep up with your individual work? 
Yeah, um, we publish everything on our website. So sec.gov slash FinHub, um, everything's there kind of categorized by technology. Um, anytime we put something out, we, we put it up there as well. There's a web portal there. If you wanna ever contact us for a meeting, just go through that and we'll get back to you. All right, well, Valerie, thank you so much. This has been uh, really exciting, really illuminating. Thank and you, I appreciate have a great rest of the expo. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Thank you, Val and Ruben. Appreciate it. All right, so now we'll be moving to our afternoon break. Uh, we'll be returning in 10 minutes at 3.40. And then just as a reminder, there is the gather.town as well as the Discord for engaging and, and networking with your fellow audience members. Uh, and there's also a merch shop. So check it out. There's a link. All these links are, are below the Slido on the main, uh, main page. Thank you. See you in 10.